remember to drop the S in Ocean. We are part of this campaign. And now I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Justin Worland, who will be the moderator of the second panel. Justin, the floor is yours. Hi, hi, Francesca. Thank you so much for uh, having me and um, congratulations on on uh, the successful event. Um, so I'm, I'm Justin Worland. I write about uh, climate and environment at Time magazine. And of course, that includes oceans. Um, one question I often get whenever I'm speaking about climate or really any of these related issues is what can I do about it? You know, people want to know uh, in the audience what they can do. And so this panel uh, is really all about turning literacy, turning knowledge into action. Um, and so we have a distinguished uh, group here who are going to uh, tell us about how we can drive behavioral change and um, yeah, and then transform knowledge into action. So the format of the panel is going to be, I believe, just like the one uh, prior. We'll have presentations from each of the speakers, and then I'll have some questions, and then hopefully we'll have good engagement uh, from the audience. So be thinking about questions, um, submit them through the Q&A box, and we will uh, answer as many of them as we can. Without further ado, I'm going to just start with our panelists. Um, uh, the first is Dr. Margaret Leinen, who is the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography uh, at the University of California, San Diego. So, uh, um, Dr. Leinen, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Justin. And hello, everyone, and happy Ocean World Ocean Day to all of you. Thanks so much for joining this important summit. Those of us in the ocean science community believe that expanding and ensuring that everyone is ocean literate, even those who live far from the ocean, is essential. And most of us at the summit here are already convinced about the importance of the ocean. But why should people that don't live near the ocean, perhaps have never even seen the ocean, care about the problems that concern us? plastics, warming of the ocean, acidification, and so on. I think that we need to help people of the entire world know what we know as scientists and as advocates for the ocean, that the ocean affects our everyday lives no matter where we live. Let's look at some of the ways that ocean affects our lives so we can understand how to make this real and how to inspire action. First, uh, as Peter Thompson told us, the ocean is the primary driver of climate on the planet. So changes in the ocean result in climate change. And the ocean can control weather events thousands of kilometers from the seashore. It affects snow, rainfall, it causes extreme heat events, severe storms, flood, drought, and through its control on climate, ocean affects our food production. So those are pretty big points to make to people, to help them understand. Second, for most of the world, the ocean itself is a, a critical important source of food. In fact, two billion people on the planet depend on seafood as their primary source of protein. Third, the ocean is the site and the driver of much of world tourism. And that's one of the biggest industries and employment sectors for the entire world. And speaking of industries, uh, we've uh, uh, the minister from Norway talked about global trade. Global trade is dominated by marine trade. Almost all products that are traded globally are transported by ship. So weather at sea, changes in sea level at ports, and other marine impacts affect products, whether we receive them or we ship them. In coastal communities, the ocean affects our health directly, for example, through harmful algal blooms and cholera. But the ocean also affects the health of everyone indirectly through its impact on climate and weather extremes. So it's essential that more of the, of the world understand this basic truth that we as scientists understand and that most of us at the summit understand. 
the ocean controls much of our lives, no matter where we live. Once people understand this critical point, we can talk about how quickly the ocean is changing, and we can explain that it's our activity that's changing the ocean. And because of how important the ocean is for all of us, that changing ocean creates risks for everyone. We in science know that we have important responsibilities in ocean literacy. Certainly, we need to generate the basic science that shows how the ocean affects us all. But we also need to take responsibility to explain science clearly and simply so that, that people understand and can take action. We have to chain, uh, train a new generation of ocean scientists who accept this responsibility. And you saw from Tyler Ray that she does. And the new generation of ocean scientists are passionate about, uh, about ocean literacy. And they understand that this is as much a part of our role and our job as scientists as is working in laboratories or going to sea. But we can't do this by ourselves as scientists. And that's why the UN Decade provides a fantastic opportunity for all of us to join together with all of the kinds of partners that are represented in the summit today to accomplish this, to affect action. We can work with our communities and our schools to ensure that understanding the ocean is taught everywhere. We need to, uh, all of those who translate ocean science into action every day by convincing others to adopt the solutions that ocean science has identified to help us show that it's possible to do this. It's not an imp impossible problem or challenge. We, know, we need those who understand the power of stories, of art and music, and how to communicate to be more effective. And we need the partnership of those who understand what motivates people to change their behavior, because just identifying the problems or telling people about them is never enough. So as so many panelists today have emphasized, people also need to know that the ocean is beautiful, it's vast, it's mysterious, it's inspiring, and so are the creatures that live in it, whether they're microscopic or gigantic. So we need to work in all of our countries to remind our governments and science funding agencies that they also have to be partners to help us play our role in this important act action. Because as Peter Thompson reminded us, we all need the ocean and the ocean desperately needs us to be better stewards. That's going to require ocean action. And that means we have to help people understand how important the ocean is to them wherever they live. It's the only way that we can all be better citizens of planet ocean. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so next we'll have uh, Kirsten Forsberg, uh, who is the founder and director of Planeta Oce Oceano, uh, which is a Peruvian nonprofit, uh, which focuses on coastal empowerment on these issues. So uh, please go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Justin. And it's a pleasure to be with, with all of you today. Um, I guess my slides will come up any moment now. Um, well, Planeta Oceano is a nonprofit that works in marine conservation in Peru. We're focused on um, multidisciplinary and participatory strategies for marine conservation. So basically, we have three different pillars, research, education, and sustainable development. Um, research is all about engaging people and citizen scientists in generating information that can lead to management. Um, education, we work with schools and with formal education, incorporating ocean issues within classrooms. And sustainable development is around market-based approaches and empowering leaders um, to develop sustainable businesses in coastal communities. So I'm going to tell you uh, a few ways on how we do each of these and also what we have learned from the process. So next slide, please. 
So starting off with citizen science, and um, I'm a biologist myself, and why I think it's, it's so important that we somehow democratize science and make it open to everybody. Um, so really, we believe that anybody can contribute with science that can lead to management. So here in the photo, we're seeing, for example, um, these are tourists and international volunteers that are coming out with fishermen into the open ocean and researching plankton and developing information that can contribute to local fisheries management, as well as our giant manta ray project, which um, these volunteers were contributing to. Um, in the other photo, we're seeing local youth, for example, learning about uh, mobular rays and studying mobulid fisheries um, that are also uh, species that really need a lot of conservation action in Peru where we work and where youth can actually contribute to um, data and management. So really what we see from citizen science is that people are not just helping to generate information and contributing, but also learning while they're, while they're um, participating in citizen science. They're learning not just about the ocean and about the importance of the ocean, but they're also learning from each other. So fishermen are learning from the tourists that are coming, for example, the tourists are learning from the fishermen, and it's really about co-creating um, and developing joint collaboration. Next slide, please. We have a network of schools it's called the Marine Educators Network. There's over 50 schools. We started in 2009. And basically this started as a response to us noticing that these coastal schools weren't incorporating marine issues in their classrooms. So it's really about engaging teachers, youth, kids. We're working with kids in game-based approaches, um, youth in incubator programs, and with teachers, we're co-creating with them and developing materials that they can incorporate within their classrooms, and we're connecting the teachers. So basically, I'd like to talk about the different um, levels. I see it also kind of as a, as a ladder of participation. So of course, uh, teachers can participate and, and kids can participate in this program um, and support different activities, say, for example, beach cleanups that their schools are doing. Um, but we want to foster really active environmental citizenship. So next slide, please. Next slide. So in addition to participating and supporting, for example, within classrooms, what we really are interested is in for people to lead, lead by themselves, their own environmental initiative. So for example, here, uh, the photo to your left is Josue. He's a boy that we met when he was four years old, and now he's 15 and he run, runs his own environmental club in his community, which is the one that you see to the right. Um, we've had over 20 um, projects incubated by youth, uh, including mangrove restoration programs, um, among others. And our, our goal is for people to take ownership in ocean literacy and marine conservation and spread the word. So next slide, please. And that leads us to our next level. Um, I mentioned about supporting and participating and then leading, and then we're talking about connecting. So these photos here are representing um, some of our Connecting Schools initiatives in which uh, youth incubator programs and projects are connecting from different countries. So here we're seeing Peruvian kids connect, for example, with kids from Costa Rica, um, in which each one is sharing information um, and lessons learned from the projects that they are implementing at field. Um, so what we really want is to generate this sort of multiplier um, effect. So um, these are one of, the, one of the examples that we have from our work, but for us, ocean literacy is not just about um, generating knowledge or, or contributing to action, but also contributing to opportunities. So next slide, please. Um, and I just want to give you a brief example of one of our projects. This is a giant manta ray that was captured in northern Peru in 2015, I believe. And we had already been working as part of our um, giant manta ray conservation project, uh, which I invite you actually to see. We've, we've posted a video on, on the summit um, portal. Um, so the mantas were vulnerable and they were unprotected and threatened in Peru. So we started researching them. And after this, you know, big case of this giant manta ray uh, was in the news, um, we reached out to the fishermen that captured that giant manta ray. So next slide, please. So here I am in the photo with Edgardo Cruz. He is the fisherman that 
incidentally captured that diamond train that was on news and went viral um, throughout the world. And we reached out to Eduardo to invite him to an initiative that we were putting together since 2013. And this was to incorporate fishermen and empower them as manta ray ambassadors for ecotourism. And so now Edgardo and his peers run a fisherman association that takes tourists out to go swim with the giant manta rays and to also collect information. So for example, those tourists that were collecting plankton are on Edgardo's boats and, and the other boats. So the way that we see um, ocean literacy is that um, as, as um, many people also mention SDG 14 plus, it's not just about contributing to the ocean, but we're contributing to local development and, and to so much, to so much more. Um, so next slide, please. So just to finish off, and um, just kind of, I was talking about the lessons learned that we've that we've seen from our community work and, and multidisciplinary work. These are some of the kind of main key components that we see: uh, the co-creation of really working together with teachers, for example, or together with fishermen and getting that empowerment because they have started working on the project from the beginning and it has their ideas so they're empowered. Knowledge, knowledge exchange in which all knowledge exchange is horizontal. Um, so for example, between the tourists and the fishermen, um, between the kids and the teachers. Um, so we really focus on identifying local leaders and then pushing them and helping them to promote multiplier effects within their communities. And of course, all of this is coupled with um, sustainability and, and monitoring and evaluation and, and strategic planning. Um, but we really think that with this model, we can create um, a real transformational impact for marine conservation. Next slide, please. So those are my contact details and thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. And I'm really excited to um, represent Peru today in, in this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kristen. Um, our next uh, speaker is Nina Jensen, uh, who is the CEO of Rev Ocean. Um, uh, Nina, please go ahead. Thank you, Justin. Hello, everyone, and happy Ocean Day. Um, nothing is more important than life on land, and all life on this planet originated in the ocean. And just a few fun facts on World Ocean Day to illustrate how incredible the ocean is. The world's largest building uh, is made by living organisms and is called uh, the Great Barrier Reef. This coral reef stretches over 2,300 kilometers and covers an area about the size of Norway, where I'm coming from. And as many speakers have spoken to already, uh, we know how important the ocean is, and we also know that the ocean is in trouble. We must make that knowledge more readily available for the general public and for decision makers all over the world to make the right decisions. And probably most importantly, we must use the knowledge that we already have and turn it into concrete solutions. Solutions. And to do so requires an increased level of collaboration uh, to what we're seeing today. It means breaking out of the old silos and bringing both old geographies, communities, and backgrounds to really get all the different perspectives, opinions, and knowledge to uh, the same table. And the decade of ocean science is the perfect vehicle to unite around to provide the science that we need for the ocean that we want. And in Rev Ocean, we are currently developing solutions that the ocean so desperately needs and hopefully inspire the world about how amazing the ocean is. And this 182 meter long research vessel jam packed with the most state of the art research equipment will be offered as a free platform to scientists innovators, tech experts, and ocean enthusiasts from all over the world. Again, with a multitude of backgrounds, geographies. And as I said, we have some of the most uh, advanced uh, equipment to help us do so, uh, including, as an example, uh, a manned submarine that can take three people down to 2,300 meters, and hopefully live streaming from the great depths, bringing the amazing wonders of the world, uh, of the ocean to the world. 
And we are also proud to be partnering with the UN Decade of Ocean Science, tailoring our sailing itinerary and to the ocean problem. And even though we know a lot about what's happening in the ocean, uh, the ocean still remains largely unexplored with endless new discoveries to be made, whether it's new species, old shipwrecks, or important solutions. So what we need to make sure is that we are collecting uh, the missing pieces, collecting the right data at the right places at the right time. And of course, I, probably more importantly, we have to make that knowledge more readily available. Uh, today we have uh, more sensors than ever, collecting more data than ever at increasing frequencies. And there's also been an explosion of new tools uh, for exploring the sea, whether it is uh, gliders, ROVs, uh, submarines and underwater drones, um, cameras, satellite technology, and more. But all of this data and knowledge does no good unless it is processing in a multitude of formats, shapes, and sizes and being stuck in individual heads and reports and filing cabinets and not being shared openly and transparently. So what we really need is also uh, a data revolution to um, enable um, decision makers to get access to the data, but also for the general public to have access to the data and hold their decision makers accountable. So we need to collaborate uh, more creatively than we have done in the past. And of course, collaborating between and across sectors and involving more than the usual suspects from science, industry, finance, uh, NGOs, and sectors well beyond the ocean. In RevOcean, we really hope to be a major contributor to that, hosting uh, grand workshops and events on board the RevOcean vessel, alongside uh, hopefully piloting and testing out the new solutions to ocean problems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we have Marcus Raymond. Uh, who's the director of TBA 21 a Academy, which focuses on interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary issues um, with to face our, eco our excuse me our ecological, social, and economic challenges. Um, um, Marcus, please uh, go ahead. Well, just, Justin, so thank you very much for uh, introducing me. Thank you. Uh, and happy World Ocean Day, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me and including me in this uh, phenomenal panel. Uh, first of all, I wanted to congratulate the IOC on UNESCO and uh, all of the partners and especially Francesca Santoro for her never-ending efforts to spread ocean literacy around the world. Um, I would briefly like to introduce two organizations that I'm involved with. The first one you see here is up on the slide is the TBA 21 Academy, which I direct. And uh, the next slide, please, is uh, the Alligator Head Foundation, which I chair. Uh, the Alligator Head Foundation is in East Portland, Jamaica. Next slide, please. Both of these in, uh, initiatives were born here, which is um, a 39 meter, a lot smaller explorer vessel than the one that we've just seen uh, in the presentation before. It's called the Dardanella, and we've been very, very lucky to have been able to use this until this year, over the past 10 years, to bring artists and scientists, indigenous community, community leaders, legal experts, filmmakers, and many, many more together out into and onto the ocean. Next slide, please. The Academy is a cultural organization exploring, sensing, and investigating the ocean through the lens of art. Uh, that being said, we broadly organize our work through three activities, research and exploration, exhibition and programming at the Ocean Space in Venice, and lastly, the contextualization and connection uh, of all of this work to a wide network of practitioners, artists, scientists, conservationists on a digital platform called the Ocean Ar Archive. Next slide, please. Um, the starting point of all of our work, though, is the transformative experience, and many speakers today have already mentioned this, but the transformative experience of spending time together on, in, and by the oceans. And from 
There we instigate intersectional, and I think especially today after the many days of, of uh, protests that we've seen, I think uh, we need to stress the intersectionality uh, of our work because uh, all climate issues are also social justice issues and vice versa. Um, but we instigate intersectional collaborative research, artistic production, and new knowledge. And these initial experiences are then developed through our fellowship programs, an artist in residency program, which I'll say later more to, um, and uh, our long-term research commissions, like Joan Jonas moving up the land, which we uh, showed here. Next slide, please at the ocean space in Venice last year, um, because we believe that for the radical changes needed to slow down the effects of the climate crisis, next slide please, we need, next slide, there is no next slide, oh, that is strange, but uh, so we need as much a cultural response to inspire communities of care and concern and to develop a deeper understanding and relationship to the ocean, um, then we need, as we need, uh, policy responses. And we need to imagine new visions of the future. So ocean space, which you see here, um, is in, and there would be a photograph, should be a photograph of uh, this uh, campo that you see now being flooded by the last floods in, in November. Um, but so ocean space is in a hot spot of the climate crisis in Europe, but is intended to be a laboratory for the future, responding to the urgencies by offering a rich program of exhibitions, educational and public programming, lectures, workshops, um, and through this becoming a space of encounter with the topics that we care for, and we, I guess, all care for, and uh, the, the rich and diverse network of practitioners that we engage in, with. Um, on the next slide, you would see uh, a coral nursery. In Jamaica, this is how everything started at the Alligator Head Foundation whilst we were on one of the voyages, exploratory voyages, to the Dominican Republic. Um, uh, we encountered, uh, with, together with Dr. Ruben Torres, who's a coral reef specialist, his community initiative of a, of a coral reef nursery. And um, we, through a long-standing relationship with Jamaica, we're, we're thinking if we can replicate this um, in Jamaica where we were uh, witnessing the reef declining. And um, so we initiated a coral reef nursery or coral nursery in uh, East Portland together with the University of the West Indies, which then over time led to the, um, to the establishment of the Alligator Head Foundation with the Alligator Head Marine Lab and later the East Portland Fish Sanctuary. And um, broadly, we've managed this, uh, this uh, activity of the foundation uh, along the lines of fish-filled waters, healthy reefs, and striving communities. These activities quickly grew into um, coral reef restoration, mangrove restoration, a turtle uh, hatching and protection program, a seagrass protection program, alternative livelihoods for fishermen that uh, fishermen that then became uh, wardens for the for the uh, for the East Portland Fish Sanctuary. They became scientific divers. Uh, they became uh, uh, lifeguards and so on. But also a very rich educational program that is now included. The mangrove program is included in two schools. There is uh, there are educational tours and so on. Um, as I said before, we connect these two organizations back to each other through an artist in residency program at the Alligator Head Marine Lab to give artists really the possibility over the course of six weeks at least to um, work with the scientists and the conservationists. Now I see we're going back to slide one, slide six. It's a, it's a wild ride with my slides. But, um, but we give them, the artists, the possibility to work with the scientists and the conservationists to really get an in-depth understanding of the work. Um, and Joan Jonas, who opened the space, was one of these uh, uh, artists. Claudia Comte, the Swiss sculptor, was the last one last year. Claudia was so inspired and moved and touched, and that would have been the last slide 
of the presentation by the work that the that the foundation does and especially the community does that she uh, um, sunk three of her iconic uh, coral uh, um, cacti sculptures onto the seafloor in the uh, in the East Portland Fish Sanctuary, which are now really a monument to the efforts of the fishermen that have dedicated their their work, still their profession, to moving outside and fishing outside of the fish, fish sanctuary and letting us experience all of these fish returning, species returning, um, and see the reef getting healthier and healthier. Um, thank you very much that it is, that's it from me, but all of this is connected intrinsically to ocean literacy. Thank you, Marcus. Um, next, we have Sylvia Spaulding, who is the communications officer at the Honolulu-based Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. Um, Sylvia. Okay. No. All right. Okay. First, I want to thank uh, the IUC for organizing the summit and OceanWise for hosting it. Today, we celebrate ocean literacy and explore its role in the United Nations decade of ocean science. In its 17 years, ocean literacy has addressed a variety of ocean education needs and has become a global community. We have tackled the lack of ocean science in the classroom. The National Marine Educators Association, with others, defined ocean literacy, developed the essential principles and fundamental concepts that ocean literate persons should understand, and produce tools to teach ocean science. We have helped scientists improve their ability to communicate scientific concepts. Developed by the Center for Ocean Science Education Excellence, California, these communication courses also provide enhanced learning opportunities to underrepresented populations and science center visitors. We have promoted the sharing of knowledge and resources by creating marine education groups across the globe. They include the International Pacific Marine Educators Network, the Asia Marine Educators Association, the Canadian Network for Ocean Education, the European Marine Education Association, and the Latin American group, Ray Lotto. Dedicated volunteers run these groups with inconsistent outside support. The full definition of an ocean literate person has three parts. The person understands the essential principles and fundamental concepts about the ocean. The person can communicate about the ocean in a meaningful way. And the person is able to make informed and responsible decisions regarding the ocean and its resources. We see the beginnings of responsible decision making in actions such as sustainability labeling on seafood, beach cleanups, and the ban on single-use plastic and styrofoam products. But these tend to be actions undertaken by the privileged. While the majority of our global community continues to degrade the ocean and place increased demands upon it. To reach the goal of ocean sustainability worldwide, we need better ways of connecting ocean knowledge to the everyday practices of all citizens. Indigenous coastal peoples have done this for millennia. From them, we can learn that a long-term sustainable connection with the ocean is one where ocean knowledge is translated into respect and responsibilities rather than extractive and non-extractive exploitation and use. For example, Native Hawaiian children are taught a code of conduct that includes respecting nature and their place in it, showing regard to seasons, taking only what is needed, and sharing their harvest. Last year, the Ocean Ops 19 conference concluded with a Coastal Indigenous Peoples Declaration. It calls on the ocean observing community to recognize the traditional knowledge of Indigenous peoples, to work with them on ocean observing initiatives, and to share responsibility and resources. The ocean literacy community and coastal Indigenous peoples should extend, extend a similar commitment to establish meaningful partnerships in ocean education. 
We can also learn from small scale fishermen who engage in ecosystem based practices. For example, an oyster fisherman in Japan donates marine life attached to oyster shells to upstream organic farmers. The fisherman says oysters are blessed by the waters flowing from the mountain. So he must take good care of the mountain and the river as well as the sea. Other pursuits that will help ocean literacy in the upcoming decade include a systemic change to ensure that ocean science has a consistent place within educational systems. Taiwan has proven that this can be done. Inclusion of traditional knowledge should also be a part of this change. Governments and foundations can assist ocean literacy by providing funds to support existing and emerging marine education groups and to develop ocean learning tools and opportunities for consumers and producers. In short, ocean literacy can play a role in teaching the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean to all levels of society. But we must also teach proven ways of relating to the ocean with respect and responsibility our everyday practices and not our knowledge, of, knowledge alone can sustain us and the ocean on which we depend. Mahalo. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so we have one more panelist before we start, uh, we get to him, but I just wanna remind everyone to ask questions on the Q&A uh, will be in the chat box. We'll be getting to those questions in just a minute. Um, so finally, we have Adrian Rogers, who is a uh, ocean ambassador uh, with a background in biology and marine uh, environment technology. So um, Adrian. The ocean engages us. Hi, my name is Adrian. Living on the island of Newfoundland in Atlantic Canada, it's easy to see just how much the ocean engages us. Our land is shaped by the sea, our culture tied to the ocean's resources, and we are blessed and sometimes cursed with the weather the ocean brings us. Because of my proximity to the ocean, it was natural for me to become engaged with ocean service. A year and a half ago, I joined a transformative program, Ocean Bridge. This program tasks young professionals to create community-based service work that is ocean related. Another Ocean Bridge participant and I co-created a seafood recipe website, which explored the sustainability of food through storytelling and culture. Through this initiative, I was able to engage with recreational cod fishers, commercial crab fishers, and other Canadians who benefit from the ocean's resources and share their stories about how the ocean engages them. After learning about the unique ways that Canadians engage with the ocean, I was able to continue learning about this across the Atlantic. As one of the 23 All-Atlantic Ocean Youth Ambassadors, I continued to work to engage people across the ocean with ocean literacy campaigns like My Atlantic Story. As I mentioned, I was fortunate to grow up beside the ocean, and today I feel responsible for keeping our ocean clean, healthy, and resilient. However, for many people, there are barriers that prevent them from developing the same connections to the ocean. This is why ocean literacy is so important. This year, I joined the OceanWise team to help deliver the Ocean Bridge program, a program which fosters a culture of service. So far, the Ocean Bridge and Direct Action programs have been successful in, in engaging 253 youth from coast to coast to coast. Our Ocean Bridge ambassadors have been able to engage with 3,729 of their peers and have collectively contributed to over 37,000 hours to ocean service. One of the strengths of this program is connecting youth from diverse backgrounds, which include individuals who have lived their entire lives beside the ocean and others who have never seen it. If you're a youth interested in getting involved in ocean conservation, look for local programs that can help support you. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope everybody has a happy World Ocean Day. Okay, so my apologies. I've, I, I did miss one speaker. We have one final speaker. 
uh, who Jayotika Virmani from the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Thank you, Justin, um, and happy World Ocean Day to everyone. I'm Jayotika Virmani, and I'm the Executive Director of the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the IOC and partners for inviting me to participate in this Ocean Literacy Summit alongside this distinguished panel. Ocean literacy underlies everything that we do in this community. Using our scientific knowledge to drive change is key to the impacts that we hope to achieve during the UN decade of ocean science. It's this recognition of the importance of scientific research and exploration to improve our understanding of the ocean and to make it healthy that inspired Eric and Wendy Schmidt to establish the Schmidt Ocean Institute in 2009. Scientists' ability to access the deep ocean has always been restricted by the expense of going to sea, and they wanted to change that equation through philanthropy and through technology, and that, that is how we were formed over a decade ago. We operate the FALCOR, currently the world's only philanthropically funded year-round high-tech research vessel. Uh, and if we can get the slides up, uh, there's an image of that on there. Our research ship, the laboratories, robotic tools, and high-performance computers are freely available to scientists from anywhere in the world to conduct cutting-edge science and technology development. In exchange, we ask that they make their research publicly available. The idea behind it being publicly available is that the findings can be used, of course, by other scientists in their work to propagate and to speed up our understanding in a field that is very much interdisciplinary but it can also be used by managers and others to take action to protect the ocean quickly. Our approach stems, of course, from Silicon Valley. The Schmidt Ocean Institute was an early adopter of open sharing of information, and we were one of the first to publicly share dives and make them available through YouTube. Falco is also the first research vessel to have a high-performance computer available to scientists for decision-making whilst still at sea so that they can run data into models in real time and alter their sampling. This makes for more robust and rapid scientific observations. If we go to the next slide, you'll see our underwater robot, ROV Sebastian. And then if we go through the remainder of the slide deck slowly, what you see here are some of the magnificent images captured by 4K cameras on board that ROV, uh, which can go down to depths of 4,500 meters below the sea surface. And actually, it's this and other technology that has allowed us to continue operations this year despite the pandemic. The Falcor is currently doing its first fully telepresence cruise, and the scientists are sitting at home, just like us, joining in remotely for live broadcasts of ROV dives. And we, as the audience, in turn join them and discover deep bathymetric features that have never been seen by humans before, or find out how deep the coral bleaching is occurring. In early April, while scientists were still on board, the ROV cameras and team serendipitously captured footage of what may be the world's longest sea creature, a siphonophora 150 feet in length, which was discovered in the Ningaloo Canyon off Western Australia. What strikes me from this large discovery is that the ocean is so vast and still so unexplored that the fact that a creature of this size was seen for the first time this year really shows us how massive this planet is and how little we know. Marine protected areas are established to protect places that we know are of special ecological significance. But, that, but without this continuing mission of scientific discovery, we may be missing something of vital importance or rarity just around the corner. Our knowledge of what 71% of our planet looks like is fairly sparse. We have a high resolution map of just over 15% of the entire seafloor. The goals of the CBA 2030 program will change that, of course, and in doing so, it will unravel an entirely new landscape with previously unknown sea mounts and habitats that will need further investigation and protection. We already know how critical the ocean is to our lives in so many ways, and this has been touched on by some of the other speakers. Uh, another recent example is the antiviral drug remdesivir that's used to tackle COVID-19 was derived from a sea sponge. In this case, scientific knowledge of the ocean is crucial for our own survival on land. But as others have mentioned, I think in addition to science and exploration, the other side to driving change 
is to convey the science to a broader audience, not only those involved in the ocean. And one way to do that beyond live streaming the dives is, of course, through art. We bring artists on board as part of our Artists at Sea program to work alongside the scientists and to create works that inspire a general public to take note and take action to help us keep our oceans and our planet healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we are running over, so I'm going to uh, keep the questions very, very brief, but I have one question that I think hopefully will capture a lot of different things. So um, uh, I'm curious from all of you communicating to, uh, to um, the public uh, and to elected officials and other policymakers, is there one fact, one piece of information, one story that really gets people to recognize uh, the power and importance of oceans. And then I just wanna bring in one question that I, we've gotten from the audience as part of that, which is how do you do that, especially knowing that politicians think on four to five year cycles? So it's a two part question. Um, and uh, you know, knowing that we have about five minutes, six minutes remaining, if each of you could keep your answers just to a minute, that would be, that would be great. Uh, and we can start, we can go in reverse order. So <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. That's okay. Um, I think um, one of the things that resonates uh, with the public is this, the new creatures and the new species. So the siphonophore, for example, uh, that we found really went global and viral. Um, and what it does is highlight the magnificence of the ocean. And I think what we need to do is to continue that aspirational and inspirational quality that the ocean brings to us. Um, and so I, I would say that that's one of the big, big pieces of this, of, of your first half part of your answer. Great, th thank you. I guess, um, be, I, uh, Adrian, uh, if, you're, if you're there, do you have thoughts? Sorry, uh, you can go on to the next panelist. Okay, um, uh, I believe uh, Marcus was right before Adrian. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, well, I guess following up on uh, something that Margaret said earlier, right? It's the immensity and, and the, the huge importance of the ocean for the climate. And I think what we see more and more in these uh, or what we've seen over the past couple of years was always this division. There's climate and there's climate change and there's climate change activism. Now we've agreed that it's a climate crisis. And then there is the ocean. Um, I think again, the, the kind of the interconnectedness and the intersectionality of, the, of uh, the discourse is important. There is no climate without ocean. And I think that is, that is um, a, a huge, I, it's such an obvious information, but many people uh, just don't know, and I think this is always striking. Great. Uh, I missed I missed uh, Sylvia. Sylvia, if you have thoughts on this question. Yeah. So, well, one thing is um, to acknowledge the importance of fishermen and traditional communities and the knowledge they hold and how they can help with the management and with the way we relate to the ocean. Um, we have ocean scientists uh, in the Western sense, and sometimes they come in and they get a snapshot of, of what's going on at, at a certain time, at a certain year. Uh, but these people who are on the same ocean day after day, year after year, generation after generation, they have a wider view of what's going on. And to be able to incorporate that in decision making, I think that's important to convey. Absolutely. Um, Nina. Thank you. And hopefully the connection is somewhat better. Uh, I think it's important to focus on the solutions and showcasing how the ocean uh, can actually contribute to solving some. Um, well, I hate to, I hate to cut the you. Oh, oh, there you go. You're back again. Sorry, I, your connection is in and out. Sorry, but go, please continue. 
So showcasing how nature-based solutions in the ocean can solve, for example, the climate crisis. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, Kirsten. Kirsten, you're up. Have your last Kristen. Okay. Um, Margaret, Margaret, are you still there? I was, I was muted. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, please. <laughs> um, no, so I was saying kind of building upon what everybody was mentioning, I'd say that uh, the power of stories is really important to connect with uh, people. So for example, this giant mantra tray, um, that I showed, they get really open people's eyes. And then based on that, uh, we reached out to the fishermen and then made the policymakers accountable. Um, so giant mantles weren't protected in Peru at that time. Um, and then really working with them, we did get legal protection for giant manta rays in Peru um, in 2016. So really having people really understand what their role in a particular issue is, I think is really important. And having that story of transformational impact that engages others. Great. Um, Margaret, last word. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll take a question that um, was raised to the attention of politicians when they have such a uh, only four to five year um, cycle that they work on. And there, I think that, you know, one of the whole points of ocean literacy is to give people the information they need to influence their own uh, their own futures. And one of the most effective ways of doing that is through voting. Uh, all of those politicians, uh, for them, the most important person is the person that votes. And uh, I think that ocean literacy is a real key here. Uh, in the chat, Wendy Watson Wright, formerly of IOC, said uh, the question is how to have ocean literacy take hold, how to measure that and ensure the message is transmitted to the politicians. And there I think that uh, it's the, the, that what we really have to do is focus on how we get the ocean literacy messages uh, to coalesce around some really big uh, ideas that can go directly to um, politicians. And here, I think the, that what we're seeing globally uh, in terms of people's reaction to uh, Black Lives Matter is a really important lesson for us, that we need to capitalize globally on those big impact events and then use those to let uh, a big impact uh, environmental event, events and use those to catalyze support and voter support. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, very informative. I learned a lot and it's, and it's great to just see, you know, literacy transforming uh, into action and see how that can really shape uh, outcomes. So I, I thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, with that, we are we are running late, so I'm going to hand back to uh, Francesca. Francesca, thank you again.